much think we only had three verses, and I paused there for a minute and, and lost my head momentarily, and it probably happened again before the service is over, okay? That's about what happens. Okay, before we go pray, I just want to miss a couple of things to, to, to pray about, because you know the pastor's not here this week, and, uh, and the, we got a preacher, Ben Clayton, will be here today, uh, going to be preaching for us. But anyway, just be sure and pray for our pastor and the family, and, and what, cause they, they'll be gone all week long. I think they'll be back next Saturday late because he's got two churches they'll be preaching into and singing. So don't forget that. And, and don't forget uh, 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 Billy's brother, uh, Jay, there. He's getting ready to travel uh, back to home today. Uh, he's going to leave about four or something or something like that, brother uh, Jay. So pray for traveling for him. And also don't forget Hunter. He leaves tomorrow. I don't know what time. Going into good old Army, but he is going into a good... A good uh, trade is the uh, combat engineers. That's the heavy equipment and stuff like that. That's what I was in, and uh, I, I highly recommend it. It, it. But at least that's better than the infantry and jumping out of planes and getting you know, on stuff like that. As far as I'm concerned, anyway. But don't forget that, okay? And also remember, Gary. Also, you know, he's uh, still recovering. Need to pray for him. Pray for Brother David back there too. Uh, he's got a, a something coming up very shortly, also. So we need to pray for him also. So let's all pray now and ask God's blessing on this service, okay? Father, we come to you now and, and thank you that you've given us another day to uh, worship you. I pray for the congregation today, Lord. I pray that uh, the preaching will be done today will draw each and every one closer to you, that we may uh, mo glorify you more in our walk and our as our light shines for you. I just pray, Lord, that you just touch each and every one's heart today, that, that we'll just uh, be on fire for you. And I do pray for, uh, for Brother John Sunday School today, too. I pray you be with him also. And I pray also for, uh, like I say, for Brother Jay as he travels back to Tennessee. And pray for Hunter as he goes back and he goes in the Army. And pray for travel mercy on them and be with them, too. And don't forget, uh, Lord, I don't, <laughs> don't forget, Lord, but I'm saying, Lord, I'm praying for Brother Gary as he uh, heals, his healing. And, and Brother David, too, I pray, God, that you would touch, do only what you can do. Now, Lord, I pray that you just bless the service today and everything we do that we'll glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all can be seated. All right. Quite a little bit of announcements I got here. I just mentioned that to Pastor. Of course, you know, it's going, like I said, it's going to be gone all week. Is our preacher here yet today? or John, you still might preach. <laughs> I told Brother John earlier, I said, John, I, I was going to mess with you a little bit. I didn't. I said, I was going to tell him that the preacher called and said he couldn't make it the day that he had to preach today. <laughs> but I will say that Brother John will, bring, will, bring us, will be bringing us a message Wednesday night, like Brother Gary does and everything, too, sometime when the pastor's out. And Brother John's all on fire, and he's ready for it. I, I bet you he's almost ready for it. Good enough, right? All right, so anyway, we've got a lot to uh, be thankful for. We've got a lot of talent in the church, and... and uh, I, I, just, I just appreciate everything he's done. Hey, by the way, now, next Friday, we just talked about that. Billy's, Billy's going to be in charge of that over there. So, uh, Mr. Billy, what we're going to try to do Friday evening, we're going to try to bring all the kids that want to come in, like a Friday night thing that we have. We're going to do not the new building. But what we're going to do, we're going to, it ain't going to be, we'll, we'll do some games and stuff, too. But all that brush over there, some of y'all, we're going we're to burn that. And y'all like to burn stuff, don't you? Uh huh. We're gonna do that and uh, and uh, play some games and uh, just whatever Billy wants to do. Okay. So anyway, we'll have a, a a good night. And that that don't have to be just children or, or teenagers or what have you. You adults would come out too and help us if you want to. Anybody wants to come out Friday at what time, Mister Billy? Six. Let's just say six o'clock. Come out. Okay. And Billy be there by six thirty. But anyway. But anyway, let's just say six o'clock Friday. And we did, and I'll try to remember that and remember that uh, and mention it again uh, Wednesday night also. Let you know what's going on in the building right now. We're uh, coming a lot closer. I've got all the posts that we need to put the fence up over there now. We'll just have to cutting some holes out on some of the posts to make them work because we couldn't get the others. But we've got everything, and I want to try to get that one roll of fence up uh, this week if any way possible. So we got that. We're so close over there, you would not believe it, how close we are. But we got a good cleaning needs to be done over there, and, uh, 
and I think, uh, what have you got on about the, the ladies supposed to be, uh, what, what do you call that, kitchen, uh, stock in the kitchen. Huh? <laughs> When's this? September 26th, okay. Oh, right here it is. You'd like a shower, right? Okay, so there's a list out there in the foyer, you say? So, so they need to mark uh, what they're, what they're going to do. I remember the pastor said the other day, be sure that everybody don't try to bring forks and knives. They're all the same. You know, but if one's going to bring it, don't. Okay. Okay. So see Miss Norma on that there also. All right. So you need a head count. All right. So when do you need to know by that? About my next Sunday? Okay. We'll, we'll do that. Okay. So everybody got that now? Let her know what's going on over there. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Uh, see, we do have junior church today, so uh, that, that's good also. We'll have that. What too many kids uh, on the bus? Uh, well, we only got, uh, what, uh, we got five kids in, but only three rode and two walked. There was two right there walked over because we couldn't find them. They weren't where they were supposed to be in, but they walked over. But uh, they're here and, and they're safe. I'm glad of that. I, I hate to see kids out walking like that, especially two young little ladies like that by themselves. Because, you know, you know, this is a, a mean, mean place today, country today. So anyway, pray for those kids. And uh, again, like I said, uh, pray for the pastor and, and, and uh, pray for John here's Sunday school. Uh, and don't forget to see Rushing Wind Radio. So don't forget to also, we're, we're live on YouTube and on Rushing Wind Radio. And uh, we're on Facebook also, right? So there's three places we're on. Am I correct on that? Do I see Shepherd back there? Oh, I didn't know you was here. You didn't go with the family? Mercy sake, good thing I wasn't talking about you, wasn't bad about you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here, Shepherd. Yeah, I didn't know he was here. Who's he staying with? God bless you, whoever he's staying with. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> Shepherd's grandma's here. Okay, I did. <laughs> Boy, you got me surprised. I told you. Uh, I lost my head momentarily. It happened again. It just did, didn't it? All right. Anything else I need to mention there, Miss Kelly, or anything? With these, oh, see that up there? That's up there too. Yeah. All right. With these next, uh, this Monday, 14th. All right, Miss Charmin, you ready for the crowd that comes over? Okay. How about you, Richard? What's going on? One minute left. To a Russian ring radio. All right. So I think I've mentioned about everything I need to mention. So let's get Brother John up here and let him do the Sunday school. And, and it's Sunday school is dismissed now, too, I think. All y'all's going to Sunday school? Y'all dismissed also, okay? All right.
Well, good morning, everyone. I, I can't, I'm smiling up here because I can't help but laugh whenever I, I don't know what it is, but whenever I hear Junior talk. I mean, like some people laugh just from my accent, but whenever I hear Junior talk, it just brings a smile to my face. The man just makes me laugh. <laughs> I don't know if he means to do it all the time, but most of the time he makes me laugh. <laughs> Well, Brother Aubrey, would you open us up in prayer this morning? Amen. Amen. A very appropriate prayer, Brother Aubrey, as we talk about those that are unsaved um, and who we run across in our daily walk. Um, today we're going to talk about the power of your personal testimony. Um, let's open up quickly with a story as I like to do normally. And um, Miss Mary Beth asked Pastor James at her church to come and pray with her 90-year-old bedridden father, Bob. When the minister arrived, he found Bob lying in bed with his head propped up on two pillows. An empty chair sat beside his bed. The minister assumed that the old fellow had been informed of his visit. I guess you were expecting me, Bob, he said. No, I wasn't expecting you, said Bob. Who are you? I'm the new minister at your church, he replied. When I saw the empty chair, I figured you knew I was going to show up. Oh, yeah, the chair, said the bedridden man. Would you mind closing the door? Puzzled, Pastor James shut the door. The old man said, I've never told anyone this, not even my daughter, but all my life I've never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but until one day I abandoned any attempt at prayer. So he walked away. From God. Then one day, a very good friend of mine, a best friend as a matter of fact, said to me, Bob, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. He shared the gospel with me and I accepted Christ as my savior, the old man said. My friend went on to say, here is what I suggest. Sit down in a chair, place an empty chair in front of you, and in faith see Jesus in the chair. It's not spooky because he promised, I'll always be with you. Then just speak to him and listen in the same way you're doing with me right now. So I tried it, and I've liked it so much that I do it a couple of hours every day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me off to the loony bin. Pastor James was deeply moved by the story and encouraged the old man to continue on his journey with his Savior, Jesus. Then he prayed with Bob, anointed him with oil, and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell the pastor that her daddy had died that afternoon. Pastor James said, did he die in peace? Yes. When I left the house about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he had called me over to his bedside just before I left, told me he loved me, and kissed me on the cheek. When I got back from the store an hour later, I found him. But there was something strange about his death. Apparently, just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head on the chair beside the bed. What do you make of that? Pastor James wiped a tear from his eye and said, I wish we could all go like that. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, We live by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. As I mentioned, today's lesson is the power of your personal testimony. We're about one month away from our revival meetings. So I believe the Lord has led me to teach on a few specific topics leading up to those meetings. Today's lesson, as I mentioned, is the power of your personal testimony. This lesson was meant for me, folks, to be honest with you. So no matter what comes out of this lesson, I know that God has already spoken to me about my involvement in sharing my testimony for Jesus with people I know and meet as I remain here on earth. 
Pastor Chris preached Wednesday night, just this past Wednesday night, on when we've hit a plateau. Some of you may remember his sermon, when we've hit a plateau in our Christian walk. How once upon a time when we were on fire for the Lord, when we were first saved, but as time went on, we let our fire grow dim, he said. He warned us not to become hardened to the cause of Christ, to the gospel. Pastor went on to say, we must have a desire to work for the Lord, not become lazy, lukewarm Christians, just living here on earth and waiting for the Lord's return or the day we will die and meet him in heaven. He also mentioned some other things, milk and meat and how we are to study scripture. Today, we're going to study the topic of sharing our testimony. To some of you, this lesson might, might not be required as you faithfully share your testimony, testimony with others as naturally as breathing, to be honest. I've, I've met people like that, and I know that there are quite a few here in this church that are like that. To others like myself, Maybe we need to be reminded of what Christ did for us and what we are to do for our Heavenly Father. When we stand before the Lord, we certainly don't want to say, I should have done more. It's interesting how the Lord directs, you know, Pastor Chris mentioned on Wednesday night, he actually used me as an example, and he says, uh, uh, he, he, sa he said something along the lines of, you know, don't hold this against me, brother, but uh, I, would, I would venture to say that you're studying more now that you're teaching Sunday school than you had before. And I don't know if it's sad, I should say sadly, the truth is that's very true. I am studying much more now, preparing for these lessons than I was before. So to, to God be the glory for that. And my thanks to Pastor and Brother Gary for allowing me to study for these lessons. If you wouldn't mind, turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to take a quick look at verse number 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just a couple verses to open up our lesson. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's speaking to us today in 2020. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A very familiar verse to many of us. Very familiar verse to many of us. So when you look at those two verses and you combine them, we're to be witnesses. I said that in Acts 1. And we are new creatures in Christ. Well, that spoke to me. And it tells us that your testimony is one of the weapons of our warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our testimony is one of the weapons of our warfare. And it's a powerful weapon when used in soul winning. Most of us think that our lives are too dull and uninteresting to an unsaved person. I could tell you personally, that's just not true. Uh, people I've come across, even as, even as a saved man, I've come across and heard many testimonies and found them, honestly, fascinating and encouraging to me, personally. That's to a saved person. So to the unsaved, believe me, your testimony is not boring, your testimony is not we remember who, if you're saved, who lives within your heart. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you to speak to that unsaved person you come, you come across. It is the Lord 
It is the Lord that empowers us to witness. We have exa examples throughout Scripture of how powerful one's testimony can be in bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Create a desire. Create a desire. It begins when you share. When you share. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Let's turn there. Matthew 5, verse 6. Short verse, but an important, powerful verse. Another verse that many of you will be very familiar with. Matthew 5 and verse 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Who hungers and thirsts after righteousness? Only the saved? Only the saved? Well, I hope so. I hope we're all in this room, and those that are listening to me, if you're saved, you hunger and thirst after righteousness. But there are people in the unsaved world as well. They may be seeking as well. They may be right there on the cusp and need someone that's filled with the Holy Spirit to speak to them, to guide them across the finish line. There must be a spiritual hungering. Before anyone is going to be saved, there must be a desire in his or her heart to want God. That hungering, your testimony, your testimony can be used by God to stir up a desire in another person's heart, quite frankly. They could come to the point of saying to himself or herself, I want what that person has. Let me talk to you folks that may sometimes be a little standoffish, like myself, a little standoffish, or a little bit, as my wife says, grumpy pants, to be honest with you. Do you think when people meet you, they say, boy, I want what she has, or I want what he has? I'll ask you all a question, everyone that's sitting here. Do you have friends? Do you have friends today? I know that I have friends. I believe since I've been attending Bible Baptist Church, I've been able to get to know a number of you men here. And I would even go as far as to say I have friends here in church. Junior, thank you for the amen. Junior may be shaking his head, no, not really. <laughs> But he's my friend, whether he likes it or not, honestly. Gotten to know Junior quite, quite well over the last number of months. I'll ask you men, do you have friends as well? And you ladies, do you have friends? Well, I have friends that are brothers in Christ. And if everyone sitting here today believes that, that you also have friends, then you know what the Bible says about that. It's a verse, there's a verse in the Bible in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, that I mention quite frequently. Um, it, it's a Bible verse that I find is, is, just happens to be very close to my heart. And the Bible verse, uh, in the Bible it says in, at, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Oh boy. I have friends, so I must show myself friendly. It's interesting how the Old Testament folds nicely into the New Testament. How we are to share the gospel as friends. You can be friendly by sharing your testimony. Be friendly by telling people to have a blessed day. Be friendly by holding the door for the person coming into a restaurant right after you. Be friendly by thanking someone for doing the same for you and be friendly by sharing the gospel of Christ. What better way to show kindness to a person you've just met or have worked with for years for that matter than to tell them about the hope you have in Christ. My home is in heaven and I know beyond the shadow of any doubt, any doubt that when I die, I will be with my Lord in heaven. How do I know that? I know that because he said that he was going to prepare a place for me. Not because I'm some really good person 
all the time because I'm not some really good person all the time. Not because I treat people nice, which we should do, but by simply putting my faith and trust in Jesus, I believe. The one that bore my sin and died for me, I believe. He will do what he said and come again, I believe. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I believe. I believe the gospel of Christ. You don't have to take my word for it. Can I show you from the Bible how you can know it? This is a great way to talk to folks that are unsaved that you may come across, whether it's at work or just in a McDonald's, like as I shared the story with the, the men in the, uh, in the prayer room. Um, a fellow walked by, Miss Janice and I were sitting having our breakfast in McDonald's before coming over to church this morning, and he just stopped as he was walking by, pointed and said, I see you have a Bible. You read that? I said, I do. I said, I have it with me most days, as a matter of fact. I said, do you read the Bible? No, I don't read the Bible. I gave up on that a long time ago. I went to Catholic school as a kid, and probably about the eighth grade, I realized I didn't need that, so I turned my back on God. I'm quoting him, aren't I, Miss Janice? Well, that's the Lord opening the door, and as I told Brother Junior and the men, I said, sit down. <laughs> so we had a very brief conversation. He had to get back to work. I said I'd follow up with him. I said, well, first of all, don't let me leave out the first words I said to him was, you may think you've turned your back on God, but God has never turned his back on you. He's waiting for you to turn your face towards him again. What a blessing that was. When you pray to come up to put, for God to put people in your path, don't be surprised when you get people put in your path and then, hamana, 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 what do I say now? So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about when we go through this series of lessons. It's only, it's only a two-part lesson today, and, and then we'll finish up next week as we prepare for uh, revival. Just, you know, another thing, and I'm going a little bit off my script here, but I'm going to embarrass her, I know, but Miss Sue, if I could get it out of my pocket, bought Janice and I one of these little New Testament to share recently. Well, I, I thank you, Miss Sue, publicly, but I will say that in my prayer time, I thank the Lord as well, because I had been praying, Lord, I know, I know, and I don't mind sharing this with the church here, I know I'm not doing enough. I know I'm not doing enough. Well, the Lord moved Miss Sue to think enough of us to say, have something, instead of carrying around this book, which is a great book to carry around with you, believe me, but this fits in my back pocket, as you just saw me pull it out of my back pocket. So I'm making a conscious effort to carry it around with me, and I've marked it already. Ms. Janice and I have marked our books already to take, the, take a potential pr prospective person who may ask questions. When you ask the Lord, isn't it just amazing? I'm just standing here. I'm, I'm still thanking the Lord and amazed that in my prayer this morning, just put someone in front of me, and then in a McDonald's within the hour? Is that a Bible? If you think that's not of the Lord, what are we doing sitting here then? John chapter 4. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. For the sake of time, I'm going to read through this fairly quickly. I'm going to read um, the majority of the chapter, but we're going to start in chapter 3 and read through 27. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. 
Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what we know, what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is coming. I know that Messiah is coming which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? I'll pause there for a moment. Let's look at a couple things. She was a woman of a, of a city. She was a city, city girl. She had been married five times. She was now living with a man who was not her husband. She could not find happiness in life. We can make that assumption. She could not find happiness in life. When Jesus began witnessing to her, she responded with, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, in verse 15. She is saying, I am hungering for what you have. In the place you work and walk every day, do people look at your life and say, I would love to have what he or she has? Is your life enough of a light, enough saltiness, that people see a desirable difference in you? a little story. A woman went to a Christian school office one, uh, one winter day, the last day of school as a matter of fact, before the holidays. She had began to speak to a school administrator. The administrator could see the weight of cares and burdens in her eyes. He began to share with her the difference in a real relationship with Christ and the game of playing church. She talked about being raised in the church and he talked about the love of God for sinners. She talked about her father being a deacon in a Southern Baptist church, and he talked about the penalty for sin. Finally, she said, I've never really heard this before. I've even prayed at a church altar in the past, but never to invite Christ to come into my heart. I'm not saved. She went home with her son, filled with excitement and joy. She had been saved. What added the icing to the cake was that in just a couple of hours of getting home and settled in for the night, her husband called, and his first words when he called that school administrator was, I don't know what my wife got from you, but I want the same thing. He saw a change in her, and he wanted that school administrator to tell him what he told his wife. God puts the desire to be saved in a person's heart. 
and we must be willing to be used by the Holy Spirit. There should be no such thing, no such thing as a pessimistic Christian. Sometimes these people say, eh, I'm not really a pessimist, I'm just a realist. Then realize this, that the last days are happening right now, and we must be busy telling people about the Lord. We are in the last days. Do you believe that? I believe it. If people understood what we have, what we have, in joy, peace, prayer, blessings, etc., they would be calling us, asking us to come to them and share the truth with them. Make sure people see a difference in your life. Make sure of that. Then, then they will ask you, and the Holy Ghost will speak through you to those people. And they'll be saved as well. Let's look at verse 28. We're going back to John chapter 4. Verse 28 says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Hmm. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. How effective was this woman in testifying? She was testifying in those couple of verses right there to the men of the city. Let's take a look now at chap uh, same chapter, verse 39. We'll skip ahead to 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own words, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. This woman shared what Jesus had said and done for her. She testified. Then the people came, they heard what she had to say, then the people came and were saved by the words of Jesus in this story. So because a person, if you're testifying, and a person does not get saved at that very moment, you're, you've heard it before, we've all heard it before, you're planting seeds. Others will water. Someone else will reap. Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven, reaps the soul of that saved person when they do come to Christ. God wants your testimony to create a desire in the hearts of people to want to know him. Not want to know John, because you know you, you shared this really great story with me, John. I really appreciate that. Well, that's great. Maybe a, there may be a friendship will develop. Ultimately, what do we want to save people? We want those folks not to get to know us so much better, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but to get to ultimately know God, know the Lord Jesus Christ. What we need to do in some, with some folks is we need to take away objections. Some people, when you speak to them or you try to testify, will have some objections. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Human reasoning cannot convince a lost person that Jesus is God. But he cannot deny the miracle of a changed life. Your testimony, your testimony, has the power to remove objections people give for not trusting the Lord. I will say that let's look at three main objections that people may have, common objections. I've heard this one before. Maybe you have. No one can know for sure, whatever that is, no one can know for sure they're going to heaven. No one can know for sure there is a God. No one could know for sure what's going to happen next. Everything is just up in the air and we, everything's left to faith. No, no, that's an objection. 
You must be prepared for it. According to 1 John chapter 5, 13, they can know for sure. They can know. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. Most people think going to heaven is a guessing game. Wouldn't you agree with that? I was at a funeral, and I really am, I am pressed for time to get through the lesson, but Miss Janice and I went up to dear friends of ours um, in, in New York City. Actually, the fella um, shared the gospel with me in high school. His name was Keith. I mentioned him to you before. Um, but uh, we've remained friends over the decades, and we're very close. We're close as family, to be honest with you. He's my brother in Christ, but he's, he's my brother. Um, and his wife is, is my dear sister and Janice is dear friend, Sonia. Miss Sonia's mom passed away, but I will tell you that Miss Sonia's mom, I watched a video that her granddaughter posted, and the video was uh, Sonia's mom giving her testimony in front of her whole family at a picnic within the last couple years, I would say. It may have been as soon as just a few months ago, I'm not sure when they filmed that. But they, the granddaughter, Alicia, ran that, and Mark, her brother, ran that on their Facebook. She was giving her, she was walking on streets of gold, and she was still here through that video giving her testimony. What a testimony, what a testimony that grandmother had to her grandchildren and to people that didn't know her, the unsaved that were at that funeral parlor. Watch that video. I stood in the back with my brother Keith and watched that video. And what a testimony as people sat in that funeral home watching, watching her give her testimony. She said, you must be saved. You must be saved. She kept saying it just like that. Well, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, then today is the day you need to speak with someone that can share from the Word of God how you can know today for sure, with no doubts, that you're going to be in heaven for eternity. That's the answer to the person that has that objection when we can't know for sure. The second one, it's too personal. It's too personal. Yes, a relationship with God is personal. That's a good thing. But someone in high school, as I mentioned, named Keith Miguel, cared enough about me to share with me what makes the difference in life? With who makes the difference in life? Can you imagine that God used a New York City public high school student, a student, 15 years old, to be bold enough to speak for Christ? And I stand in front of you today. Hmm because he cared enough for me. <clears throat> Pardon me while I sip this water. <laughs> it's not too personal, but it's always too personal between you and the Lord. Here's the third objection. The sarcastic comment. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It is sad that most people who are sarcastic as adults were most likely the children who were given too much. Spoiled children, quite frankly. Why? Because it's easier for parents sometimes to give a kid what they want. At least that's what they think. They think that's easier. That's not really easier. That makes it a lot harder to lay it down the road. <laughs> These children grow up and marry, and someone has to live with them for the rest of their lives. Right, Jack? <laughs> Sarcasm and all. They should have been corrected when they were still in diapers. These are the people who become angry because they don't want to hear something or talk about something that is unpleasant to them. And honestly, sometimes things of God become unpleasant to people. The sweet spirit of a Christian, however, can help people overcome these kinds of emotional roadblocks. 
A soft answer turneth away wrath. Cause people to examine their own lives, folks. Help them to look inward. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. When you begin to give your testimony, the person listening to you immediately begins to relate what you are saying to himself or herself. It's human nature for us to try to find a relationship to what is being told to us, tying it to our own lives. Sometimes we think, hey, I've had those same questions. Or I've struggled with those same doubts about God. The power of giving your testimony comes in having the Holy Spirit couple scripture and your conversion with your conversation. I'll say that again. Kind of a twist on words there. The Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit couple scripture, the Holy Word of God, and your conversion, your conversion with your conversation as you speak and talk about your conversion your testimony. People will examine their own lives when you give your testimony. Have you ever watched or listened to people in church that sometimes they take their own or they tell you a story? I know I've heard this. Um, after hearing uh, a missionary or a, a person from their church that's gone on a missionary trip, and then the next thing you know, it's kind of infectious. Someone else who's never gone on a missionary trip wants to use their money as well and go on a missionary trip. Well, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's kind of infectious. You want what they had. You want to experience what they experienced. Amen. Well, guess what? The unsaved person that you're speaking to and you're showing, shining your light to them, that's what, that's what the Holy Spirit uses. That's what the Holy Spirit uses. They want to have what you have. They want to share in that. If we don't speak up and share with others as the Holy Spirit leads us, People may never truly examine their own lives. Sharing our faith, honestly, can be fun. We hear many sermons about the joy of salvation, but sometimes Christians come across as the least fun people on earth. Happens. I think sometimes we're hesitant to enjoy life for fear that we may become or appear too worldly. People are attracted to joy and laughter. So if our faith is to be attractive to other people, perhaps we should be willing to laugh at ourselves every now and then. Have a little bit of fun in the Lord every now and then. Here's another thought. How about if you discovered the cure for COVID-19? Would you keep it to yourself and tell no one? Of course not. We hold in our hands, we hold in our hands the answers to the meaning of life. We should be sharing this good news with everyone around us. People don't like to think in terms of eternity, but they need to. They need to. Manifest the presence of Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. We just, say, we just studied Satan's strategies over the last number of weeks. The devil has some powerful works. But Jesus came so he could be manifested and destroy the works of Satan. We must know our enemy. We must not underestimate him. That's what we studied over the last number of weeks. Two works of Satan. Satan builds strongholds around people. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Satan puts blinders over the eyes and minds of lost people at times. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil blinds the lost. The devil blinds the lost. When we witness, we have the promise from God. Remember this. When we do witness, and when we are bold enough to witness, 
we have the promise from God that he is always with us. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Read that on your own. When lost people resist your witness, they are really resisting the gospel in Jesus Christ. They're not rejecting you. They may say something that is a little off color or not so nice or just downright mean to you. That may happen. That may happen. But think of what Christ went through for us on the cross. Can, can I listen to, listen, I was a New York City policeman. I had, not like today, I will tell you that, but I had lots of people say very mean things to me. If you don't develop a thick skin, I'll say that to the Christian. Develop, develop, and know who you're working for. We all have a job. My job isn't to be a, a manager, an executive in a company. My job is to share the gospel of Christ. Determined to show them the love, the kindness, and gentleness of our Lord, and they will come and talk to you when they have a problem, just like the young man James today. Just like the young man James. Mm. Manifest Jesus in our own words and works. We must remember that ultimately it is the Holy Spirit's work to save souls. It's not John's job. I don't save anybody. The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, saves the soul. Our job is to plant the seeds of faith and to love people the way Christ loved us. And he loves them. And if we can show them that Christians also know how to have fun, perhaps they will want to find out more about the reason for our joy. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Pastor Chris says that quite often from the pulpit. Usually it's when he's cracking up. He's laughing at his own joke. I mean, he's, in his mind, it's hysterical. So he loses his mind up here and starts laughing, and then he says, oh, the merry heart do the good luck for medicine. Anyway, no offense, Pastor Chris. Prepare the heart to receive the word of God. There's only one way to be saved. One way. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, being born again. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Bible is the seed, and the seed must be planted in the heart before a person can be born into the family of God. Take time, maybe this week, to read a little bit on the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. We see several kinds of hearts. We see, we see in, in that parable the stony heart, the shallow heart, the crowded heart, and the good heart. When, wit when we witness to someone, look at the potential of every heart. You may see a stony heart. You may see a shallow heart or a crowded heart. There's too much in that person's life that's going on, so they're not receiving the words that you're sharing with them. But every now and then, you come across the good heart, the good heart, and that's the person that will listen to your testimony and that you'll be able to share the gospel of Christ with. Two ingredients to prepare the heart. Light, light. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Light and work, which is our second part, work, light and work are not the same thing. The light is the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. We sometimes tell people, can you shed a little light on that for me? We're not asking for a flashlight or a spotlight to be shown. We're asking for more information. Explain this for me. Tell me what happened. Let your light so shine before men, unsaved men, that they may see your good works. Those works, again, part two. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Work is talking about what God is doing in your life and what he has done in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. God renews us day by day. Every day we must be renewed. We should be more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. God predestinated us. God. Like his son, Jesus. God can use your testimony to help others. They can see the emptiness in their lives. Your testimony coupled with scripture can cry. Letting just a little light to come in. It only takes a little light for a person to see the works of God are greater than the works of the devil. The devil's a liar. We know the devil's a liar. The devil will continue to lie to the unsaved. Have you ever seen a small sprig of grass growing up in the crack in the sidewalk? That's a kind of a strange thing. I did landscaping, so I was thinking about this the other day. It is a strange thing because we see concrete all around it. But there's that little sprig of grass growing up in the concrete. All it took was one seed, one seed, to get down there in that concrete with a little soil, a little light, maybe a little moisture, and that seed grew. One seed. You could plant that one seed. You might be able to plant that one seed today. Maybe when you go out for lunch after service today, or when you go to work during the week. Or when you're sitting in a McDonald's having breakfast, maybe. God takes our testimonies, like I said, and cracks open hard hearts. God will use your testimony. Just speak up and share it with someone. During a man's, men's Bible study and prayer breakfast, the topic of trials was brought up by one of the men that watched as a dear brother in Christ was battling a disease. He remarked how even though the man was going through this trial, he was still very much filled with the joy of the Lord, and he watched as this man's faith seemed to grow through the trial. The leader of the group began reading the third chapter of Malachi. They came upon a remarkable expression in the third verse. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3 says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, it says. The man decided to visit a silversmith. So off he went. He asked the silversmith to tell him about the process of refining silver. After he had fully described it to him, he asked, But sir, do you sit while the work of refining is going on? Oh yes, replied the silversmith. I must sit with my eyes steadily fixed on the furnace. For if the time necessary for refining the silver be exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver will be injured, it will be damaged, it could be ruined. The man at once saw the beauty and comfort, too, of the expression, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. God sees it needful to put his children into a furnace sometimes. His eye is steadily intent on the work of purifying and his wisdom and love are both engaged in the best manner for us. Our trials do not come at random. Some folks in this very room, in this very sanctuary, are going through similar trials to what I'm talking about. He will not let us test it, be tested beyond what we can stand, what we can endure. Before he left, the man asked one final question. When do you know the process is complete? Why, that's quite simple, said the silversmith when I can see my own image in the silver, the refining process is finished. When our Lord sees himself in us, the process is complete. Amen? Brother, will you close us out? Brother Kemp.